Ansible is an extremely useful automation tool for managing computers and network devices. And all my years as a Cisco engineer have got me used to using a command line. Sometimes you find a graphical interface can help you do things better. And for Ansible, that's where something like Semaphore comes in. You can use it to schedule playbooks, to receive status notifications. It can handle your secrets and so on, which for me makes task management much easier. But how do you install Semaphore as a package on a Debian computer, for instance? Well, if that's something that you're interested in finding out, then stick around and watch this video, as that's what we'll be going over. Now, there are several ways that you can install Semaphore, and in this video we'll be installing it as a Debian package, although the process should work on Ubuntu as well, for instance. I would have preferred to run this as a container on my Docker server, but for some strange reason the web server you get doesn't support TLS. The suggestion of using a reverse proxy doesn't help unless it's on the same computer as the one running Semaphore, because if it's not, you'll still be left with unencrypted traffic in transit, and that would be flagged in a security audit. Now, I don't want the extra admin work of managing Nginx, for instance, just to address a security weakness in Semaphore. So, for that reason, we'll install everything on a single computer, so people will need to log into the computer to use Semaphore. Now, Semaphore requires that you have Python as well as Git installed, in which case we're going to install those. Now, the first thing I want to do is just make sure that uh, the actual package information is up to date. So we're going to run apt update first. And then once that completes, we'll get it to install Python 3 as well as Git. Now, this is a Debian 12 computer, so I already know it's actually got Python 3 installed, but there's no harm in including that. And Git is a requirement because if you actually try to install Semaphore and you don't have Git installed, the actual installation process will fail. So even if you've got no plans to actually connect to a Git repository, you do still need to install this. So I'm just including dash Y just to save me answering the prompt. I'll then hit return and off it goes and actually starts to install those packages. Now, for me, as I said, Python 3 is already included, so let's just skip that. Now it's just often installing Git as well as any other dependencies for that. Now, not surprisingly, Semaphore requires that you have Ansible installed because, well, it's going to be using that to run your playbooks. Now, I actually already have Ansible installed on this computer, but when we look at the version, what I'm getting is 2.14.3, and that's a, an installation that I've done using Debian repository. The problem is that, well, this particular version that I've got here isn't receiving any more security updates, which is a problem, but also apt key has been deprecated and the Ansible module that you need for its replacement isn't in this version either. In which case, what I'm going to have to do is to uninstall my version of Ansible first and then we're going to have to install a newer version. So we'll wait for this to uninstall Ansible. The only thing is we're then going to have to remove all of the dependencies as well uh, to, in, to installing that. So just wait a while until it finishes that. And then what we'll do is run apt auto remove. So hit return and this is going to take bit longer. So I'm now just going to double check that Ansible has actually been removed. So we're going to run the Ansible command and just put in dash dash version for instance and it should return. As you can see here an error to say that Ansible isn't installed. It can't find it on the computer. Or at least not in my path anyway. Now we want the latest version of Ansible. Uh, what Debian themselves actually suggest is to use pipx to actually install third-party packages for example so the idea is you get official software through debian themselves through their actual repositories files that they've actually vetted and checked and then if there's other third-party software that you want use pipx it'll put it into a virtual environment and makes it a bit more safe so we need to install pipx itself first so i'll just use that sudo apt install pipx and off it goes and installs that now that that's done, we'll run one more command here, pipx ensure path, 
hit return and as it says it's updated the path but it's suggesting to open a new terminal or re-log in to make sure that the path changes take effect so I'll, I'll just close that terminal start a new one as it suggests and I'm just going to increase the font size here just to make it easier to see and then we're actually going to install Ansible itself using pipx so pipx install dash dash include uh, dependencies then Ansible is the one we actually want to install hit return and yeah this this is going to take a while well now that that's finally finished I'm just going to check to see we've got Ansible installed and uh, we'll just run Ansible dash dash version and see which version we've got so at the time of recording we're now up to 2.16.2 now semaphore requires access to a database and unless you've already got one available that you can use then you do need to install one now the default choice looks to be mysql in which case we're actually going to install that because i can't actually get access to it through the actual debian repositories i need to get it directly from the source which is oracle so that's why i'm on this website here so what I need to do is to click on the download option here. Uh, it's going to ask about cookies, which I don't particularly want. I'll just close that. I don't specifically want an actual account for this, even though it is free. So I'm just going to click on the option. No, thanks. I just want you to actually download the file click on that. And then that should download it to my downloads folder. So we'll jump across to that. We we'll switch over to the folder. And then what I should be able to do is to install that. But do make sure that the actual version that I'm showing here is actually uh, the version that you've got. So just hit return. What's my password? Assuming I'm actually type. And then it installs that. Now I'm quite happy to go with the default options here. So I'm just going to use the arrow keys to drop down to where it says OK. Tab over to OK itself. Because you can make changes to these specific settings here. Uh, just takes you through other pages. But as I say, I'm, I'm just quite happy with the default settings anyway. So I'll go with OK. and installs that. And now we're going to run apt update. Because what we've done basically is to update our repository uh, details here. So now you can see how it's referencing over to mysql.com as a potential repository. Then what we need to do is to actually install mysql. So we want the server and we want the client. So hit return and off it goes and starts asking for an actual password. So just a curiosity, I'll see if I can paste this in. Yes, I can. Fortunately, it does actually blank it out, which is good. Then once confirmation of that root password. Okay, now it's giving us a choice of strong password encryption or legacy authentication. In this case, it's a completely new database anyway. And it makes more sense to just go with the default option of having strong password encryption. So I'll leave that set there and then uh, we'll hit OK. And then off it goes and continues with the actual installation. Well, now that MySQL has actually been installed, there is one more thing I want to do, which is just to make sure that it is a bit more secure. So we're just going to run this command here. Just copy and paste that in. So it's MySQL underscore secure underscore installation. So we'll start that. Uh, straight away, it's asking for the root password for MySQL. So this is not the actual root password for your Linux computer. I mean, it is really strongly recommended that you do use different passwords. This is just the root account for MySQL itself. So I'm going to paste that in there. Now, what it wants to know is, do you want to actually validate the password component? So I think that's a good idea. Um, make sure that passwords are strong enough. So I'm going to stick with the default. Uh, so I need to you know why and then hit return. It then wants to know, what do you want? Do you want low, medium, or strong passwords? Well, 
I'd rather uh, have strong passwords or an option two. Now it's estimating that the strength of the password I'm using for this root uh, user is only 50. So it does give you an option here to actually change it. Uh, because this is only a video, I'm just going to leave that as is and just say, uh, no, I do not want to change the actual password. Now it's saying that it's got an anonymous user in here, which isn't really a good idea. I mean, something that might go into say like a test environment or something, but I don't particularly want that. So yes, I do want to actually remove that anonymous user. So we'll select the option. Uh, yes. Then it's saying that normally only the root should be able to get in through a, a local connection as opposed to via the network. That does make a lot of sense. So yes, I do want to disable the ability of the root login. It's also got a test database and well, we don't need access to that. There's no point keeping it. So we'll say yes to remove that. And now we just want to know, well, all of these uh, questions have been answered. So do you want to actually reload the actual privileges table for this to take effect? So I'll say yes. And that's it. That should have made it a bit more secure. Now, what I'm then going to do is just double check that my SQL is actually running. So I'll use system CDL and then status just to check the status of our MySQL database. And there you go. It's, it is active and it's running. So don't seem to have a problem with MySQL. So that should be now ready to use. Now, the next thing to do is to create a database for Semaphore. So what I want to do is to actually log into this database server as the root and then I'm just going to copy and paste in my super secret password and then that gives me access to my SQL and then tell it to create a database now I'm going to call this one semaphore but you can name it something else if you like and you don't necessarily have to put uh, the actual instructions in uppercase but I like to make things stand out a bit here so hit return that gets us our database. Then what we're going to do is to create an actual user account because it's not a good idea to have people logging in as the actual root user and uh, making changes. It's better that applications and users have their own individual user accounts. So you've got accountability. So I'm telling it to create a user. Now I'm calling this semaphore, but it probably makes sense to use something less obvious. And this is all on one single computer, so I'm referencing the domain as just being local host. If it had been, say, like a centralized um, database server, it would have made more sense to actually include the actual domain name. And then I'm putting in a super secret password. Return. Oh dear, it doesn't meet the actual security requirements, and that's because of the settings we put in earlier. So I'm going to make a slight tweak to that password just so that we can get past the requirements. But again, I would suggest using something uh, much stronger and more complicated than that. Hit return, and that gets us our user account. Now, the next thing we need to do is to actually give this user account access to the actual database that we created called Semaphore. And then that's it. What I'm gonna do is then just exit out of my SQL as the actual root user. And this time what we're going to do is just check things by logging in as this actual semaphore user. Uh, put in the password for that. And then just see that we've actually can see something. I'm going to get it to actually just show the databases as an example. And you can see these are the databases it can see, which includes that actual semaphore database that we set up. So as far as I can tell, we should be good to go. We've got our database user that we can uh, tell Semaphore about, and we've got our database. Now we can install Semaphore as a package, but before we do that, it's best to check what the latest version is. So over on this web page here, uh, we've got details here telling us how to actually install uh, Semaphore as a package for Debian or, or Ubuntu. And although I could click on this option to copy the clipboard, it's going to copy everything in one go, but at least we can tell here that we're on 2.8.75 for at least at the time of the recording. So what I'm going to do is go back to the terminal and then I'm just going to use wget 
to actually download that actual file. And then we're going to install that package. So I'll just copy and paste the command in for that. Hit return. And it wants my password here to do that. And off it goes and install Semaphore. Now, one of the really appealing things about Semaphore is that you can schedule tasks. In other words, run your playbooks at certain times of the day. Now, in order to do that, we'll be running Semaphore as a service, but it's not a good idea to be running this using the root account or indeed any privileged account, in which case we're actually gonna create a new user. So I'll just copy and paste in the command. Now, I'm gonna set the home folder to be slash opt slash Semaphore, because we'll be using this for other purposes. And I want to make sure that we're using bash as the shell. Now, I'm actually calling the user account semaphore, but I would really suggest using something a lot less obvious than that. But I just want to keep things simple here. So off it'll go and creates that, sets up the home folder. And then what I need to do is just at least give this a password. So now it wants a password to use. So I'm going to give this one something slightly different because I don't want this to be the same password that we use for the actual database so I'll just confirm that again and there we go we've now got our user account created uh, plus the actual password for it I'm going to change the actual permissions for that actual folder because I don't want anybody being able to get access to it um, because there's going to be sensitive information in there because it's not just a simple home folder where we're keeping a config file there's other information going to go in there so i'm going to restrict access and while we're here we're also going to create a group now i'm going to call this ansible group because the idea is i want users on this computer plus semaphore to get access to the ansible files and they're going to be stored in a folder so while i'm here i'm just going to actually create a new group. Now I've called it Ansible group. I would suggest using something less obvious than that, to be honest, but once that group's created, I'm then going to add the users. So for now, that is going to be myself plus that semaphore user. Now the dash M option is something you need to be careful of because we're really just telling it to add David and semaphore to this group called Ansible group. Now I'm going to hit return. It's going to do that. But what this is actually going to do is basically reset the list of users as well. So it's something you need to be careful of. So if I need to add a new user to that group, well, if I use the dash M option, I have to include both of these existing users at the same time. So I'd have to declare all of the users as part of using that dash M parameter. So it's just something to bear in mind. Anyway, we've now got our actual user account set up for Semaphore plus an actual group that we can use to give Semaphore access to uh, the actual Ansible files. Now, Semaphore is going to require a configuration file to run. And although we could download an example from the website and then edit it, what we're going to do is to actually generate our own config file. First thing I need to do is to actually switch over to that Semaphore user account, go to its home directory, and just go and double check yeah, it is slash opt slash semaphore. So what we're then going to do is to run this command semaphore then setup. And it basically just walks you through a wizard asking you questions. And then based on those answers, it'll generate you a file. So the default option for the database here is MySQL. That's what we've installed. So I'm just going to hit return. It then wants to know how to connect to the server. In other words, what's its domain name or IP address and what port to use. So the default is a loopback address and then port 3306, which for us is fine because we've actually installed MySQL on this local computer. Then once the username, well, we're not logging in as root. We're gonna log in as Semaphore. Then it wants to know the password for that account. Now, what I will warn you is that this actual password when we either type it in or paste it in is going to be visible so just bear that in mind then it wants to know what the actual database name is called well 
we called our seller for that happens to be the default but obviously if you've used a different database name you'll want to change that i don't so i'm just going to hit return you want to know what the playbook path is so this is a working directory if you will uh, i'm going to set that to slash opt slash semaphore to keep everything in the same folder we're not running multiple websites off a server so this doesn't apply to us so i'm just going to hit return i do want email alerts so i'm going to put in yes and hit return want to know what our actual email server is so for me it is mailrise.homelab.lag so i'm using mailrise port is hit 025 now the sender address well it's defaulting to semaphore at local host but i'm going to set this to be semaphore at homelab.lag to match my domain it then wants to know do we want to send telegram alerts well i don't so i'm just going to go with the default option slack alerts i don't so again i'm just going to go with the default option do you want to use ldap authentication well i don't but that is a useful feature because the idea is semaphore is set up for teams yeah to have multiple users who will be using it uh, but in this case anyway um, i don't want to use ldap authentication but it is there as an option so I'm just going to hit return. It wants to know what the output directory is. Well, we're already in slash up slash semaphore, so I don't need to change anything here. And then off it goes and starts to create our actual tables as well as our actual config file. Now, eventually, as you can see, the actual process halts and it's prompting for a username. Now, it's actually asking you to actually set up an admin account for this. So I want to just give this an account name of, well, I want to call it admin. I would obviously suggest using something less obvious than that, but I just want to keep things as simple as possible. I want to know what's the actual email address going to be. Now, for me, if any emails get sent to this admin user, I actually want them to go to slack at mailize.xyz. In other words, this is the email address where you want your alerts going to for that admin user now obviously you've got the ability to set up other users later on they'll all have their own individual email addresses for me because i'm using mailrise well to be honest everything's going to go to slack at mailrise.xyz so it ends up in uh, an actual slack alert but in any case that is going to be my actual email address it then wants to know what the actual name is so this is just going to be called admin so i'm just going to hit return it wants to know what the password's going to be so i need to give this user account a password as ever it, it actually shows up on the actual screen so that's something you need to be aware of and that's it it's finished it's actually done the actual setup process if you have a look in the actual folder we've also got a config.json file it does actually suggest to actually launch it to use dot slash semaphore but the thing is that actual command doesn't exist in the current working directory if you actually ask it just out of curiosity yeah it's actually in slash user slash bin so that's just something to bear in mind if you actually just want to run the actual um server directly from the actual terminal session but really we want to run it as an actual service now earlier on in the video we installed ansible or more specifically, I reinstalled Ansible. Reason being is I wanted to have the latest version. Now, the only thing is, as you'll see here in a minute, if I actually ask what the version of Ansible is while logged in as this semaphore user, it's coming back with an error message saying that the command can't be found. And the reason being is because we actually use pipx to install Ansible. In which case, I need to install Ansible for this actual semaphore user to be able to use. I mean, the reason I installed it on my account is because there are going to be times where I want to do my own testing with Ansible independently of Semaphore, in which case both actual user accounts here need access to it. So first thing I'm going to do is run X and show path just to make sure that we've got everything set up properly. Uh, as it suggests, we need to get out of this, basically this terminal session suggesting you can log out and log back in and so on. But I'm just going to exit out as the user rather than actually exiting out completely because that's enough because it, it means we're uh, no longer log, uh, logged in as that user. But 
then what I could do is log back in again or rather switch over to that user account I need to put my password in to be able to do that switch the home folder check again I'm a bit paranoid and just double check Yeah, so it's pointing at the moment to slash opt slash semaphore slash dot local slash bin here, which is what we want. Then what we've got to do is go back through that process of installing Ansible again using Pipex. And yeah, it's going to take a while. Well, this is eventually finished. So all I'm going to do is just check that we've got Ansible available. So there we go. So now Semaphore users got access to version 2.16.2. Now Ansible allows you to set up a default configuration file, which basically saves you having to type the same sort of parameters out over and over again at the command line. Now, most of the actual settings that I've put in there can actually be defined within Semaphore, but there are two in particular that I still want to have. So I need to set up an Ansible.cfg file. And because of the way that Semaphore works, I need to actually create one within my home directory, which means it actually has to be a hidden file. So I'm going to use nano, create a file called .ansible.cfg, and we are already in my home folder, or at least within the home folder of Semaphore. Then I'm just going to copy and paste in the settings that I want. So we're defining our default settings here. I like to have this interpreter Python setting of auto silent. Basically, it's just you get warnings if it runs into problems with uh, the actual Python interpreter it finds. So I like to suppress those. Also, when you log into a computer for the first time using SSH, you'll actually get prompted if you want to accept the fingerprint. Now, that's not practical when it comes to automation with something like Ansible, in which case I've got this host underscore key underscore checking uh, setting here, which is set to false. So I'll save that. And because this file exists within the home folder, I don't have to actually create similar files for every project that we set up, for example. And those are sort of settings that apply no matter uh, what project I would set up for Ansible anyway. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is to actually set up a service to actually run Semaphore. Reason being is I want this running 24 by 7 so that I can actually schedule my tasks. Now, first thing I need to do though is to exit out as this semaphore user because it doesn't have any privileges. That's deliberate. Then we're going to create our service file. So I'm creating a file called semaphore.service and I'm putting it into slash Etsy slash system D slash system. And I'm copying and paste in the details that work for me. And stress that because some of these settings are going to depend on how you're setting things up. So we're setting up some conditions here where I want to make sure that the actual binary file itself for Semaphore exists um, before it tries to actually run the service. It's always going to be called Semaphore because that's the name of the command. But I also want to make sure that the actual config file exists. Thing is, mine exists within a folder called slash opt slash semaphore. The name of that binary and the name that I've got for the folder just happens to be because I've set up a user called semaphore and I've set up a folder to go with it called semaphore within this folder slash opt. So a lot depends on where you're putting this um, config file basically. That's where you want to be pointing uh, your service account to. Now when it comes to the service itself, I want this to be running as a non-privileged um, service, basically. I, I don't want to be using a root account, so I'm stressing that I want to actually use a semaphore user that I created, and that's a group that goes with it. But you can run into problems with pathing, especially because of installation using Pipex uh, of Ansible. So I want to make sure that it knows the path for that user. This is basically what I've done is I've just copied the path that I would have getting for that user when I when I actually log in as that user I want to make sure that the actual service account when it's running actually sees that same path otherwise it just throws an error for instance saying it can't find Ansible so that's the reason for that environment path but again a lot depends on where you've actually set this all up 
So everything for me is in slash opt slash semaphore, but it might vary depending on what you call the user, uh, what you call the folder, where you actually create the folder and so on. Then lower down where we're actually starting um, the actual uh, semaphore uh, application. Again, that's fixed. It's slash user slash bin slash semaphore as up there. But the config file that we're then pointing it to is in, for me, slash opt slash semaphore. So up here, we're just checking to make sure these things exist. Down here, we're actually making use of them. So do make sure that aligns with you know, how you set this all up. And then finally, I've just got an identifier for syslog of semaphore. Now that's because the actual application is going to be semaphore. So that's going to basically stay the same, but you could change it to something else if you particularly wanted to. I'm just keeping it simple. I'm just calling it semaphore. So that defines the actual file. So we'll exit out of that. Now, next thing to do is, well, we've actually changed something here as far as system D goes. So we need to make it an update. So we're running system CTL and uh, daemon reload. I want to make sure that this service will always start when the computer boots up. And then we're going to actually start it. See if it throws any error messages. No, nope, hasn't complained. But all the same, I'm just going to check the status. And there you go. It looks as though so far things seem to be working. So for all I can tell, Semaphore is now up and running. Now, in order to connect and stop managing things in Semaphore, what we have to do is point our actual web browser here to the web server that we get. So for me, this is going to be HTTP colon slash slash localhost and then port 3000 there. Now I'm using localhost because this is installed on the actual computer itself. We're using HTTP because, well, HTTPS isn't actually supported. They do not give you a secure web server for some strange reason. I mean, you can actually try to use HTTPS as interestingly enough, their documentation suggests. Hit return and no, nope, doesn't work. Doesn't even give me a, an option to say, well, just accept the private certificate. It just doesn't work. Um, I do find that odd because if you go through the documentation, they'll say you can only use HTTP for the Docker version. They don't specifically say anything about being able to get HTTPS with this packaged version, yet, oddly enough, the URL that they give you has HTTPS, or at least it did at the last time I checked. But the only way to connect is through this unsecure process of using HTTP. So we'll do that. Then what it does, it comes up with the login point. So when we run the setup, I created a user called admin. Now I need to put in my super secret password. Uh, click on sign in. So it's now logged in. And the first thing it wants us to do is to create a new project. The reason being is that's the way Semaphore works. It expects you to be doing everything within projects, which makes a lot of sense uh, for teams, to be honest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new project and I'm going to call it video. I'll click on create. And that's it. We've now got access to a project and all these other things that we can do. Although one tip I'll give you is down here, we've got an option for dark mode. That makes a lot more sense. Now, as you'll have seen when you first log in to Semaphore, you have to create a project. And once you do, it gives you access to all these other things within that project. So anything we set up here is specific to that project, but we can create other projects. To do that, click on whatever the project happens to be that you're in at the moment, and it gives you an option to create a new project. So for instance, we'll just call this one test and then click on create. So that creates a new project and it automatically switches across to that project. Now, it is unusual for companies to delete things, but if you actually want to delete a project, make sure you're actually using that project. Go over to settings, then just select the option to delete project. It does come up with a confirmation just to make sure you do actually want to remove it, but click yes, and that's it. And now it's just pushed us back to that original video project. But that's how you actually 
manage your projects. Now, usually for Ansible to be able to gain access to an IT device on your network, it'll have to actually authenticate. And when it comes to Semaphore here, that's where the key store comes into play. So if we click on key store, we've got an option here to create new keys. And one thing I'll stress is that there's various sections within this project where you need to provide credentials, but you can't just type them in. You've actually got to reference a key within this key store. So that's something to bear in mind. It's best to set up all your keys first before you go any further. In any case, for us, we're using Ansible to actually log into computers using SSH. So we actually need to use SSH key authentication. So we we'll click on new key, give the key an actual name here that we can reference it by. And then for the type, select SSH key. We can tell it what the user account is here. And then you would copy and paste in the private key. And I'd stress the private key, not the public key, the private key. The only thing is, well, all of this information is visible. And although this is a video and just a lab, I don't want to keep going through the process of recreating keys every time I do a video, in which case I'll set this one up off camera. Now, what you do next really depends on how you've got this set up, because there's another option, which is login with password. So you provide uh, an actual login name plus a password. Again, that information is visible. So do bear that in mind if anybody is walking by and look over your shoulder. But this would also be useful, not just for a system where you do log in with a username and password, but also if your Ansible user account has to provide a password to get pseudo rights, for instance, you'd have to set up another key to be able to do that. Now, in my case, the account can actually log in using SSH key authentication, but it doesn't have to provide a password to get pseudo rights. So I don't need to provide another key for Ansible itself to do that. However, what I do need to do is to set up another key, which I'm going to call anonymous. And I'm going to set that type to none, hence anonymous. Now, as it suggests here, they're talking about, you know, maybe you're going to log into a repository or a web server or something to download something, and there's no need for um, any user authentication. In my case, I'm going to have the actual Ansible files stored on the computer. And the Semaphore user account that's running Semaphore itself as a service will already have rights to those. So I'll be setting those up later on. In which case, it doesn't actually have to authenticate as such. But when we actually go to set this whole thing up, it's going to actually ask for a key. In which case, I do need this anonymous key to actually do that. So whatever type of key you're going to create, you fill in the details, then click on Create. Once you've actually got a key, what you can do is you can delete it. Just click on uh, the bin option there, or you can click on the pencil to edit it. Now, if you want to make a change, you've got to click that override option. In this case, all we can do is just change the type, but with other types, with the SSH key, you could then give it the new uh, private key. If it was the, uh, the actual login with password type, you could give it a new password, for instance, and so on. And then once you're done, you'd click on save. But either way, that's how you actually set up the keys within the key store. Now, in order for Semaphore here to actually be able to run any of my Ansible playbooks, I actually need to tell it where those Ansible files are. And that's where repositories comes into play. So you click on repositories and then click on new repository to set up a new one. But before we do that, I'm actually going to set up a new folder on this computer because that's where I'm going to be storing my actual Ansible files. So I'm going to just switch over to a terminal session. And now I'm going to create a new folder in slash opt, and I'll call it Ansible. Uh, for that reason, I need pseudo rights to be actually able to do this. But it's not just me who needs access to these. So does Semaphore and basically anybody else who's going to be um, using Ansible on this computer. So I'm going to change the ownership so that the Ansible group is defined as the group for this. So this is a group that I defined before. And at the moment, I'm a member, but also as that Semaphore user. So we'll change the ownership. And then I'm also going to change the actual permissions because I don't want everybody to have visibility of it. 
today what we're going to do is to actually switch over to that folder and what I could do is then create a folder in here um, which is in line with the actual project that we've got created in Semaphore but since we've actually got Git installed I'm going to take advantage of that and I'm going to get Git to actually create the folder for me we'll swap over to the actual folder there reason being is if you look here it's referring to the initial branch as master now if you're used to using git online it's actually referred to as main so i'm actually going to change the branch to be main instead well back over here on semaphore we need to tell it where the actual ansible files are and that means setting up a repository so to do that we click on repositories then click new repository now because it's a local folder i'm just going to call it local and then once the url or path to get access to the repository as you can see there's quite a few choices here in terms of how to connect to a git server but when it comes to local folders like we're using it wants the absolute path so i'm going to copy and paste that in so it's slash opt slash ansible and then within there we set up a folder called video to go with the actual project name now although i configured git within the actual folder that's just basically for me to be able to do my own versioning uh, we're not actually connecting to a git server as such using any of these protocols so this option about the branch is actually grayed out the last thing to do is to tell it how to essentially authenticate now we're connecting to a local folder and the user account that's running this semaphore service already has access to the folder so it doesn't need to log in again in which case i'm actually going to select the anonymous key that i set up in the key store here because there's no point logging in when you've already got access to it so with all that done i'm going to click on create and then that gives us our repository the only other things to do are well you could delete the repository you do have to confirm that you can edit the repository and you can also create other repositories within your project if you like now ansible requires access to an inventory file which gives it details about groups of hosts for example that you're referencing within a playbook now for semaphore you can actually set up inventories um, to do that click on inventory then click on new inventory you give it a name so for example i could call this well just inventory now i can't type in username uh, details and passwords and that sort of thing i've actually got to click on this option here user credentials and actually pick something that i've already defined within the key store so for me ansible is going to be connecting in using ssh key authentication and i've set up a key within the key store that has details of the actual um, ansible account so i'm going to select that it doesn't need a password to actually gain pseudo rights if it did i would have had to set up another key with a username and a password and i would have then selected it here now we've got a choice of types so you've got static static yaml or file static is probably the more common way so we've got an example but for me it would be something like these are my pve nodes so i've got a group called pve nodes and the, uh, the actual ip addresses of them you can also do it in a yaml format but it's basically just the same it's just a different format that's all so you've got choices when it comes to these static types. the only thing to bear in mind is that you're going to be entering information and it goes into the actual project itself so if you want to maintain these inventories you're going to have to keep coming back into here and updating that entry in there adding a new host removing a host and so on and what i was thinking of is that if you've got several projects and they're all referencing the same hosts the same essential inventories it seems a bit quite a bit uh, extra work more admin to do because you're going to have to do that for every project now if these are mini projects all referencing their own individual servers and that's all they touch that makes a lot more sense but if you're going to be running multiple projects but referencing essentially the same servers just seems like too much work 
I mean, it is useful in the sense, I mean, you don't have to maintain, say, like one big static file, for example. I mean, what I could do is set up an individual um, inventory, say, for my PBE servers. I could then have another inventory for web servers, another one for database servers, and so on. So you can actually get your playbooks to reference um, whatever inventory is relevant to them. But for me, I think it's just the, the extra admin work kind of puts me off. So for that reason, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to call this inventory and I'm going to point it to a file instead. So I need to put the actual path to this file. I haven't created it yet, but I'm going to call it inventory and I'm going to put it into the slash opt slash Ansible folder. Reason being is for me, I might have multiple projects going, but they're all going to reference that same inventory file. So I just need to maintain one specific inventory file right across the board so it makes more sense to put it into the parent folder so whatever it is you're doing just click create and then that creates your inventory now one thing to point out is another good thing about the file option is that it doesn't actually just pull all that information in once you create it it just keeps referencing back to the file so all i have to do is just keep maintaining that actual file itself and semaphore will be up to date but Obviously, it's no use without an actual file. So I'm going to create that file. Uh, I'm just going to use nano to do it. So I'll get it to create this file called inventory in slash opt slash Ansible. Note, I haven't had to use pseudo rights to do this because, well, I've already given myself rights to this folder anyway. Anybody in that Ansible group as well is going to have access to it. But I now need to copy and paste in the details. And then that gives us an inventory. Now, Ansible can take advantage of variables. And for step four here, what you can do is click on environment and then click new environment. And you've got choices for extra variables and environment variables. And they do even give you an example in JSON format there. Now, personally, I've got no particular plans to um, set up variables this way. I'm quite happy to just set up the actual files themselves. But even if you don't want to use this, the way this is all set up, you still have to have at least an environment uh, set up that can actually be referenced. So I'm going to actually create one called empty, just that I know it's an empty environment, essentially. And what I've got to do is to copy and paste in some curly brackets similar to those there's just nothing in them but as i said you, you've got to have at least an environment uh, to reference so this one doesn't really do anything but at least it's defined so i'm going to click on save and that gives me an environment now as we'll go over later you will run your playbooks as tasks but what you can actually do is to set up views for them so do that if you go over to task templates by default all you've got is this tab here called all but you can actually set up views here so if i click on the pencil it's saying at the moment there are no views but if i click add a view i can create a new one and i'll call that this one in the spell and then click that tick box there add another one call that one test two and click that one uh, test three and so on. If I now close the actual dialog box here, you can see we've got actual tabs. So this is quite useful if you want to actually filter um, tasks out because you can actually assign them to views. But if you actually want to remove these, what you can do is click on the pencil button again, and then just click uh, the cross next to them to actually delete them. And then it removes them. So that does have potential there, if, as I say, if you want to actually filter uh, your actual tasks out. Now, in order to run a playbook in Semaphore here, what you've got to do is set up a task for it. And to do that, you click on Task Templates and then click New Template. Now, when we're setting up this new template, you've got a choice of a task, build, or deploy. Now, for the sake of this video, we're not going to cover build or deploy. All we're interested in is actually running a playbook. And that means setting up a task. So what we've got to do is give it a name. Uh, the description's optional. 
we've got to tell it to the name of the actual file, which for me is going to be ping.yml. Now, one thing I'll point out is that you can't actually browse for that file. You've either got to copy and paste it in or you've got to type it. it makes no difference if you provide, you know, the repository and tell it where to find uh, the actual files. Still not going to give you an option to browse. Then what you have to do is provide the inventory, which we created in the inventory section. Repository, which we created in the repository section. And the environment, which we created in the environment section. And all three of those are mandatory. So you've also got to set them up in advance. And again, even if you don't want to provide any variables uh, within an environment, you've still got to set up at least an empty uh, environment that you can point to. Now, if the playbook needs access to a vault, you can provide the vault password here, but it's got to be something that you've set up within the key store. So it would be one of these login passwords, but it won't have a username just an actual password for this to be able to get access to the vault. We've got an option for survey variables. So if you click on that, you can fill in the details, pick a type string or integer. And these are basically variables when you actually run this task and run the playbook, you'll actually get prompted to provide the values. Now that's no good if you're running these at uh, a scheduled time of the day because well, you would need interaction, but the option's there if you want to use it. As I mentioned before, you can have views. Now, I've only created one. Um, you don't have to actually provide a view. It is optional. But for the sake of this example, I'll pick that one out. Now, I'll touch on cron in a minute, because the other thing I'll mention is you've got a choice here to suppress success alerts. So maybe you want to run your actual tasks, but you don't want to know if it's actually succeeded, you only want to know if there's a fault, so you can actually suppress any alerts that way. And then you've got an, an opportunity to put in command line arguments here, if you will, and it's providing some examples. Just remember to select that box, allow CLI args, and it's got to be in JSON format here, as you can see. Now, I'll come back to cron. Reason being, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate a, a bit of an oversight, I'd say, on, on the part of the developers. If you're not familiar with cron, it's basically it's a way to actually schedule uh, actual things within Linux here. And although in some respects it's quite useful, I've given you this URL here where if you click on docs, it opens up a tab and you can get details um, and you've even got examples. So for example, this one here, I'll just copy and paste that. So what it's detailing is the number of seconds, minutes, hours, day of the month, month, day of the week. So it's useful in the sense that they're pointing you to the documentation, telling you a bit more about it, giving you examples um, through cron themselves, essentially. But if we go back to uh, Semaphore itself, let's say I paste in that example to run this job every hour on the hour. If I click on create, it actually it won't let me create it because it's saying it's only expecting five fields, but we actually got six. That's why I'm I'm saying this is to me an oversight on the part of the developer, particularly if you're not familiar with cron, because here we're getting told about setting up a cron job using six fields, but Semaphore only accepts five fields. So I can see in some respects why they're only using five fields, because what you need to do is delete that first field. In other words, the seconds. Because, I mean, typically you're going to be running these maybe every quarter of an hour, every hour, half hour, these sort of things. It's, it would be very unusual to run an actual task at a specific second. Um, so they've, they've obviously removed that as an option. But yeah, that could that could actually throw you on the it. Anyway, I'm not going to be setting this up to schedule because it's just um, something I wanted to point out for the video. But... I want to actually run this actual task manually. So I'm leaving that empty and I'm going to click on create. And that creates the actual task for me. Now, when I say it creates the task, if you click on that option there, it expands out because essentially every time this gets run, it spawns up a new task. And that's going to be the same for any other task that you create. And what's really, really useful to me about uh, Semaphore here is that it's going to give you really a history of every time this gets run. Uh, you'll be able to know when it was run, 
whether it was a success or not and so on it's to me that's just extremely useful compared to just setting up a cron job and uh, within you know the command line basically so I, I do like that a lot that's a a really appealing thing here so semaphore is not like an all-in-one solution you've still got to have a separate way of creating your ansible files through a text editor of some sort um but this yeah this this is it seems to be a much better way of, of actually running uh, your actual playbooks once they're ready now we've only got one task here but you'd get the same opportunity for every task that you create um, very useful that you've, you've got this option to actually run it um, directly from this view here I mean actually if I go over here you can see we've got and this is a view called test one if I create a new one called test two again select that one we don't see anything about that ta uh, task because it it only belongs within view one so it's, it's a good way to filter things out but i do like this you'd end up with a lot of actual tasks and you can run any of them individually directly from that line so that's very very useful now we've got some information about each individual task as well its status which version we're on to in terms of how many times it's been run but if you actually click on the name of the task you then you're into the details of the actual task itself so you'll just get the details the history of that one task in this uh, pane of view here which is very useful again we get information about the task up here we can run it again you can delete it and i do like that that uh, option there where you've got to confirm it you can actually copy it which is quite useful um but if you want to edit it you click on the pencil then you can make changes to it so that's that's very useful that it gives you that high level view for all of your tasks but then you can you know drill down into each individual task and you'll get similar sort of things on the history of tasks run um within the dashboard as well but obviously i've actually set up a task here but i don't actually have a playbook so i'm just going to have to do that next so i'm going to keep this simple what i'm going to do is just create that very file we've referenced and it's not really going to do anything it's just going to log into all of the actual computers hence why I called it ping so it's just a ping test as such but it does actually log in so that then sets up our task now semaphore here is really aimed at multiple users in other words the idea is you'll have a team of users working on your Ansible projects now at the moment all we've done is to create an admin user and that was as part of the actual uh, setup of semaphore itself but it's not really good for individual users to log in as the admin because there's no accountability and it makes a lot of sense as to why they picked LDAP as well because of this um, support for teams but because of the way we've actually got this set up we've got an admin user and we're going to be using local authentication so we're going to have to set up individual accounts for each individual user so to set up accounts we're going to click on admin then click users then we'll click on new user then we can fill in the details for the user so i'm using mail rise so really everything has an email address of so slack at mailrise.xyz for me so i'll put in a password which incidentally does actually get obscured here i know when you're setting up the keys that information doesn't get obscured so i don't know why they haven't done it across the board I've only done it here so it would be useful if they'd done that elsewhere but anyway we can make this user an admin user and we've got an option to send alerts to this user now bear in mind um if you don't enable that feature then well you'll probably never see alerts somebody at least uh, involved in the project has to have this feature enabled if you want any alerts being sent out essentially i mean when you actually set up your admin user which is interesting that isn't enabled by default for that user account which i suppose makes sense you'd probably be sending uh, emails to the individual users for the project or maybe for a team leader it's really depends on your circumstances but that's something i want to point out make sure that if you do want to receive alerts make sure that somebody who's working on this actually has send alerts enabled now what you're going to find is when i click on save yeah uh, again an error message request failed status code 400 now that's not 
very specific. Um, I was scratching my head for a long time. I've seen people reporting uh, maybe it's to do with a version. Some people have ended up um, just manually editing the database because of certain circumstances. For me, what I've found out eventually, because I've got two computers, I've got a live system and I've got a lab system. And it's a case of, ah, it took a while before the penny eventually dropped. The reason I'm getting this problem is because I've got two users with the same email address. They're both exactly the same and the system will not accept that. So I've got to change this to something else. Now, in a normal sort of like team network, everybody would have their own individual email addresses. Um, this is probably just because I'm using uh, MailRise. The idea is that all of the computer systems send an email message to MailRise, which in turn will then send an alert out to some service. Uh, I'm using Slack, so that's always going to be the email address regardless. But now that I've changed the email address, click on save, and here, voila, that's done. So it's it's interesting. It's not very specific uh, to point it out. So yeah, it took me a while <laughs> to figure that out, but that, that is the cause of my problem. But at least it's now solved and I've got two users. Now, it's quite useful because you can sort on individual columns. The external, by the way, is to do with if these like LDAP users, for example, which in my case, they're not. Uh, these are local accounts. That's why none of them are enabled. From what I can see here, I can't actually enable things, make changes to individual accounts at this level. I'd have to actually go into that user account and make changes that way. Uh, there is an option to delete a user if you wanted to. If I click on delete, you get the confirmation. One thing I'll point out though, is this admin user. At the moment, I've got a project up and running. I've got an admin user, which is basically the super user essentially. And this is my only admin user. If I take away the rights from this account and make a save, I'm not going to get any warning at all. And this is going to just open up a whole heap of problems. It doesn't ask me to confirm it. In other words, it's not checking to see, is this the last user with admin rights? It just says, yeah, okay. And the problem then is it's broke at that point because there is no admin left to make administrative changes. And that just cause you a whole heap of problems. Now, if you're familiar with MySQL, as in the database we're using here, or whatever SQL, uh, whatever database you're using, you can actually make changes within the database itself because it's that's all this is. It's just saving information, and each user account will have uh, an actual column in there to say whether it's got admin rights. So you could fix it that way, but do bear that in mind. If you ever decide to take admin rights away from a user, really you need to make sure that at least somebody else on the system has admin rights. Otherwise, it, it, as I say, it just breaks. Anyway, it's relatively easy to set up users, although it's not that, to me, it's not that blatantly obvious that the fact that you've got to click on the actual user account to then do it. I mean, it gives me an, an opportunity to edit my own account because that, that's the user I'm logged in as, um, for example. But yeah, that's not so obvious. There's no nowhere else I'm seeing to set up users as such because as i'll point out in a minute there is a team but you can't add people add people to the team unless you've actually created them as an actual user account for example so yeah it's a bit an odd way i would have thought it might have been easier if they'd created a separate little section for users that way but that's how you create users now as i mentioned before semaphore here supports multiple users but whether you're connecting this up to an LDAP server or creating local user accounts like I did before, these users don't actually have access to anything unless you make them a member of the team for an actual project. So we've got one project here, which I've called video. And to add a user to the actual team, you click on team. Then you click on new team member. And then from there, you just click on the drop down box and it goes through the list of whatever you've got in terms of users, and then you can pick that user to be added to it. You can make the user an administrator if you like, but in any case, once you've made your choice, click link, 
and it adds that user to the actual team. Now, the thing to point out is that we've got administrative users, go back to users. So these are admin users for Semaphore. But when it comes to team members, you'll actually be an administrator of the actual uh, project, if you will. So I could make this user an administrator of the project, but they're not necessarily an administrator of Semaphore here, as you can see. Likewise, just because you're an administrator of Semaphore, you're not necessarily an administrator of a project. So we're going to come back to here. Now, this is something I want to point out because it's similar to uh, what I was mentioning before about users and admin rights. You've got to be very, very careful when it comes to admin rights. If I take away admin rights, there's no warning here. If I were to take away their admin rights, I could run into similar sort of problems where nobody can actually manage the project as such. So you've got to be very, very careful when you're taking any rights away. I mean, I can't edit this user. To be fair, there's, there's not really a great deal to do because you just picked it um, from the list of known users anyway. Any changes are really only involving admin rights. But if you don't particularly want that user uh, as part of the team anymore, you can just delete them. Uh, at least that uh, prompts you for a confirmation to actually remove the user from the project. It doesn't remove the user account itself. The user is still a, a local account, which in some ways might make some sense as to why you don't just see a users section here, because it's not users that are specific to the project. When you're creating users, there are, you know, these are users from the perspective of Semaphore as a whole, whereas I suppose team is specific to that actual project. So relatively simple to set up, but you do have to be very, very careful when it comes to this admin rights. Now, one area in Semaphore, which I think could do with a bit more attention is when it comes to actual alerts. And that's because by default, you don't actually receive any. Now, to me, alerts are extremely important. I don't know if the task has failed or actually succeeded, but by default, it's not going to happen. And there are quite a few hoops here you've got to actually jump through. And to some extent, I kind of get it. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility here, but yeah, it's just, there's just too many hoops involved. I think it could be simplified. So in my case, I actually prefer to get my alerts through emails. And although we went through an actual setup process, it's not enough. We're going to have to manually edit the config file to finish this off. So what I need to do is to edit this config.json file for Semaphore, which is why I'm logged in as the Semaphore user here, because I've got it in the actual home folder, because this user account is actually running Semaphore as a service. Now, if we go down to here, there's two lines I'm going to have to update. One's going to be the username, and the other's going to be the password to get access to the email server. Now, most servers, I'd imagine, do require authentication, but we weren't asked you know, to do that as part of the setup process for some reason. Another thing to consider is that down here, we've got another line, which is email secure, and by default, it's set false. Now, when you're going to connect to an email server and provide credentials, you don't want that going in clear text, so you'd really want that set true. So in my case, the way I've got MailRise set up, um, I'm going to have to provide a username and password to get access to it, and I'm going to have to set that to true to actually be able to then send my emails. Now, once you've done that, and for those changes to take effect, you would have to actually reboot the service incidentally. Um, there are other things still left to do. So we've got a, an actual project here, uh, which I've called video. But if you create a new project, you'll notice that by default, alerts are not actually enabled for the project. So every time you create a project, you're going to have to remember to select that option to receive alerts. Maybe in the case of the developers who do this, they don't particularly want alerts or something. I don't know, but for whatever reason, by default, that's not enabled. If you've already got a natural project like I have here, you can go to settings. And if you forgot to enable it, at least you can tick the box and then click save. But that's not enough. We've then got to go back to our user here because at least one user 
needs to be able to receive alerts. So I'll just click save again on that. Yeah. If we go back to our list of users, I'm going to have to make sure that our admin user here can receive alerts because that's the one I'm going to be using. Without that, we just don't get any alerts. So something else to bear in mind is, yeah, there's all these extra steps. The project needs to have it enabled. A user account needs to have it enabled. And in my case, the config file needed to be updated as well. But having said that, there's one slight patch. So I've got an actual uh, task set up. So if I edit that, the only option I've got here is to suppress successful alerts. That's disabled by default in my case. That's great because I actually want uh, to be actually told if an actual task succeeds. Reason being is that there's always the possibility somebody might make a change, say a firewall change, which locks Semaphore out from being able to get access to the email server, for instance. The trouble is, I won't know about that until somebody actually then logs into Semaphore and starts seeing, you know, tasks that have failed, for example. It just couldn't actually notify me um, that, you know, those actual uh, tasks failed because it couldn't get access to the email server. So I like to have this option where I'm always actually receiving alerts regardless. That way, at least I know things are always working in the background. Um, tally up to individuals, but that's just my preference. So we've got an option here where you can actually suppress successful alerts. The only trouble is it only applies to if you're using Slack alerts, for example. And from what I've been reading on the forums, this is a deliberate setup. If you're using emails like I am, you'll receive an email if a task fails, but you will not receive an email if a task succeeds. So that's something to bear in mind. Vice versa, as far as I'm aware, and I haven't tested it because I'm not using this with Slack, but if you get it to send Slack alerts, in other words, you've configured it uh, within that config file to send Slack alerts, then you will receive alerts for tasks that have succeeded but that's going to be a problem for me because well i've got everything set up to use an email server so everything's sending emails to mailrise which in turn then sends alerts to slack I, I don't really want different computers sending alerts to slack for instance i'm trying to keep the security as tight as possible only mailrise has got access to these sort of things over the internet basically but that's just not an option here I'm stuck with a situation where, yes, I can get failed alerts on emails, but not successful ones. So the only way I can see around this would be for me to set up maybe like a playbook, run that on a regular basis. And what that does is to actually send an alert um, or an email rather over to Mailrise, which in turn sends me a Slack alert. So at least I know that Semaphore is able to get access to the email server, but it's a bit of a shame. I, I don't know why they've done it, from what I've read in the forums, it's a deliberate um, setup on their part. So at the moment, that is the way it is. So I can work around it. Uh, but it, I mean, the good thing about it at the end of the day is I can still get alerts, assuming everything's working. I should still be able to get alerts, which is ideal. And it, it makes this thing a whole lot better than if I was just running cron jobs through the command line, for instance. So at the end of the day, this is still extremely useful in comparison. Now, the last thing to do is to actually test this all works. And what we're going to do is to actually get it to run this playbook here. So we've got a task and we've already drilled into it. So as I mentioned, there are different ways that you can manually run a task. So where we are now, we've got an option to just click on run. Or we could go back to task templates where you get a, a, basically a list of all the tasks you've got. And then in the actions column here is a, an option to run. So we're going to click on that and start off and it it actually asks uh, if there's any additional parameters you want to put in so these are your typical command line parameters you might want to add as extras i'll leave those there's also an advanced option which i'm not really sure why it's there because all it does is point you back to the cli arguments settings for the task template itself anyway but in any case i don't need to add anything to this so i'm just going to click on run and then it'll pop up a dialog box um, and actually try and run this playbook. So off it goes through the process and it says it's running that. So it's now gathering the facts, it's pinged those actual servers 
which really means it's actually logged in to them. And so it's actually finished now. So it's it's got a status of success. So that means that's done. If you go back to dashboard, it's this is a basically a history of all of your tasks, which is it's quite useful if you just want a top level view. I mean, it's telling you what the name of the task is uh, that was run, who actually run it, when it was. So at the moment, it's just a few seconds ago. And very useful, obviously, is the actual status. Uh, if you have a look at activity, there's all sorts of things going on back there. But if you go over to task templates, there you go. It's showing you that we've got an actual number against this task. So if I expand this out, you can see we've now got a, an entry for that. And now we've actually got an option to rerun it. Now, to be honest, I'm not quite sure of the benefit of that because it still spins up another task as such. So we've got this task. I don't know. It's kind of a bit confusing, I find, because we've got this concept of task templates. I would have thought that was the task template in itself because it then creates all these tasks. But if I click rerun here, it doesn't literally rerun task number one here that's been defined for this um, ping task we're running. We get another task spawned anyway. So it doesn't seem to me at least to make any difference whether I click that or click that. So if I click that again and click run, in this case, we haven't made any changes, so we'd expect the same result anyway. And we'll just go back through the process of um, connecting to a playbook and then trying to run it using Ansible. And uh, the servers certainly are still up, so the results are the same. So if you see we've now got um, task number two. It's not actually showing it at the moment. If I compress that and try to expand it, now it shows up. So it's showing it in reverse order, basically. The, the um, I suppose the most recent byte at the top there. Uh, on the other hand, if I click on rerun, we're just going through exactly the same process. So as I say, I'm not, I'm not really sure what the difference is because we've got task number three now. So it hasn't rerun task ID two, it's just gone back through the whole process. So yeah, it's got me a bit confused, I must admit. But in any case, that one was a success. So it does not automatically uh, update itself but if we click on the actual name of that task that we've got now we've just got specifics about um, that one task that we've got rather than kind of an overview of all tasks but either way I, I really like this to be honest because it's aside from the you know security and quibbles about alerts I mean I've got this all now running on a single computer so I'm pretty comfortable in that aspect of it but it means I can schedule this to run tasks using Ansible at certain times of the day regularly and what it'll then do is it'll go through the process of running those tasks or at least trying to but then I can come back and get details and it's keeping a record of all of the tasks that have been run what the status was and that that to me is, is absolutely ideal and um, it's that historical information there's also the actual um, status of, say, the last task, for example. That's extremely useful to me. And, yeah, there's, there is a quite a few sort of like, steps to go through to, to set up, I suppose, a basic cron job, what it is, in the grand scheme of things, I suppose. But it's still extremely useful. Now, as it turns out, um, well, I've been running an older version of Semaphore for a while, and... Yeah, we, we actually installed this older version as part of the video. And I actually only found out about it when I ran into this 400 error message. And it was a case of, well, people were talking about newer versions on the forum. And I was kind of like scratching my head because if I go to the documentation here and go through the installation instructions, it talks about version 2.8.75. So, well, I just assumed that they were keeping the examples and documentation as a whole up to date but if you go to the releases page up here well we're actually up to 2.9.41 at least as far as the betas go and um, the latest version is actually 2.9.37 and the version that i've been using is actually over a year old uh so yeah 
On the plus side though, it's a case of, well, this is an opportunity to do an upgrade. Now, before we actually do that though, what I'm going to do is just scroll down here, go to page two, because the warning at 2.94 here to back up your database, the reason being is they're actually going to make changes to the database. And once you do that, you can't then roll back to an older version of Semaphore because it won't be compatible. I mean, basically the jump from 2.895 here to 2.94. So that's something to bear in mind. They introduced new features and it required a database update. Now, in my case, I'm running this on a virtual machine. So I've just took a snapshot uh, so I can just roll back if things go uh, pear shaped basically. But in any case, what we need is version 2.9.37. So what I'm going to do is switch over to the terminal session here and I'm going to shut down the actual service first. Provide my password. And then go over to the downloads folder because the process for upgrading is just the same as for actually installing it in the first place. So I'm going to download 2.9.37. Then once that's actually downloaded, what I'm then going to do is to actually then install that version. And then off it goes. And as it says, it's unpacking Semaphore 2.937 over the top of 2.875. So then what I need to do is to start the service back up. It doesn't complain. But I'll check. Yep, it's active and it's running. But because I know it's going to make changes to the database, I think I'm going to leave it a bit of a while and then we'll check and see. Well, I'm back here on Semaphore and I didn't log back in. I just did a control F5. It hasn't asked me to log in. I mean, I mean, having a look around just to see if everything's working, even run a task and yeah, seems fine. So in terms of changes, what I've noticed is that down here in the lower left, we've now got a choice of languages. By default, it's set to US English. Then next to the portrait, if you're an administrator, it actually flags that up, which can be useful, I suppose, if you're trying to make changes, for instance, and you're wondering why you can't. Well, that's an easy and quick way to find out. Up here in the top corner, underneath the name of the project, it now actually tells you what your role is uh, for that project. I mean, we're logged in as admin and admin created this project. So seen as an owner. In other words, they've introduced roles into this. If we go over to the actual team here, you can see against the user, you've got a choice of, well, you can be an owner, you can be a manager, you can be a task runner, or you can be a guest. So that makes a lot of um, sense, really. I mean, especially in teams, because you might have different people from uh, different departments or something who need different levels of access. So that is something uh, that's useful. I'm just going to have a look and see what else that I noticed. I mean, this is covered in the notes, but I don't know, maybe this is just a, a feature, shall we say. <laughs> um, one thing I've done is I'm pretty sure history, activity and settings was over here. Now it's over there. If I click on history or activity, that seems fine. But if I click on settings, all of a sudden that shows up billing. So it doesn't show up if you highlight it on these two, but it does on this one for some reason or on settings for some reason. So that's something it looks like they're going to be introducing, as it says. I don't know why they've actually included it to tell you that or why it only shows up when you're actually on the actual settings tab. But in that case, that actually sounds quite useful. Um, I mean, if you're doing Ansible projects for customers, you can do billing uh, within your projects, for instance, for different customers. And even if you know, you're know in an IT department, sometimes they actually build departments, for instance. So that that is definitely a useful feature that they seem to be introducing. So that could be something to look forward to. But yeah, at the moment, it's just a hint of what's to come. But other than that, I haven't noticed anything else specifically. Uh, go back to my task here. As I say, things seem to be the same. I haven't done anything about this advanced um, option, which to me just seems kind of pointless, to be honest. 
um, and we're still stuck with HTTP as the only way to get into the actual web server portion and manage Semaphore, which is a shame. But other than that, yeah, they're, they're introducing new features as they go along, so that's definitely something useful to see. So far, Semaphore looks to be a very useful tool to help with fanciful automation. I really don't understand, though, why the developers couldn't have provided a web server that supports TLS. For that reason, I wouldn't consider this to be a modern UI because even vendors selling devices to retail switched to secure web servers a long, long time ago. I mean, I can get around the security concerns, though, by installing everything onto one computer and then accessing Semaphore locally rather than remotely. Bear in mind, I've seen reports in the forum about sensitive information being leaked to logs, for instance. So not only should access to the computer be heavily restricted, but any exporting of logs for analysis will have to be vetted. Documentation provided could also do with some more attention. There are a lot of hoops to jump through to set up Semaphore this way, and they're either not mentioned or explained well enough. And if you're starting out with this, it can be a bit of a struggle to know what to do and that's why documentation is important. In the grand scheme of things, though, this is, is a very useful tool for running Ansible playbooks. Now, if you find this video to be useful, then do consider subscribing to the channel, as that would really mean a lot to me. But it's also a good indicator to let me know how videos like this are helpful to people such as yourself that are watching. In which case, thank you. On the other hand, if you're not ready for that level of commitment, then I'd really appreciate it if you could press the like button, because that way that'll help to get the video out to other people that might find it useful as well.